Forget the politics. We have a national crisis. We are at war. There is no politics. So our news cycle is changing, if not daily, then hourly or by the minute. And there's so much information out there today, and it's difficult to navigate the waters of the news. Over 2,980 deaths. It was another rough day for the financial markets. They're going to do a 30-day extension. Over 4,700 deaths. Which means another month of this. So one of the things I want to do is talk to some of the biggest thinkers in the world and say, hey, what are these problems and what are the unforeseen consequences of what's happening in real time? We have entered into this next phase uh, that has required me uh, under the circumstances uh, to uh, advance a proclamation uh, of a state of emergency in the state of California. Now, one of the biggest questions is all of these emergency measures, all of the data collection to sort of say, well, what's happening with the pandemic have knock-on effects. And I think one of the greatest thinkers around civil liberties and these unforeseen consequences is Edward Snowden. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. So today we're gonna to talk to him about his thoughts on the COVID virus, as well as what does that mean for our civil liberties? Edward Snowden, thanks for being here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's just jump into it. Why does it seem like we're so ill-prepared? We're acting like COVID-19 is a never-seen-before virus and that this is just out of nowhere, surprise, surprise. You know, we had SARS, we had MERS. We've had these types of things before. And in fact, we knew that we were going to be having more of them yet we were not set up, or it seems like we were completely taken aback that this is happening now and is having you know, such a profound effect when if you talk to any epidemiologist or virologist, they knew that this was gonna happen. There is nothing more foreseeable as a public health crisis for, uh, you know, again, a world where we're just living on top of each other in, in, in crowded and polluted cities. Uh, than a pandemic. Uh, and yeah, every academic, every researcher who's looked at this uh, knew this was coming. And in fact, even intelligence agencies, I can tell you firsthand because I used to read the reports, uh, had been planning for pandemics. And yet when we needed it, the system has now failed us. And it has failed us comprehensively. And the thing that I find grotesque about this situation is that now the people who are being asked to sacrifice the most are the people who are in the most precarious positions, who have the least to give. We're constantly being told uh, we're the richest country in the world. But when people start losing their jobs, when uh, rents uh, become difficult to pay because there, there's no work uh, for any waitress uh, in any restaurant in, in New York right now, where are our resources? When our hospitals say they need ventilators, you know, where is all this great technology that's being used to surveil everybody, uh, you know, down to the tiniest toenail, when we need it to create things that actually save lives? In South Korea, which has been successful in at least flattening their curve, the government's been sending text messages to people who have come into contact with people that they know have COVID-19, which means they know who has COVID-19, they know who they're meeting, they know their text message numbers, they know how to get in touch with them. The Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uses data provided by local telecommunication companies. Taiwan is doing a mobile fence, so-called, where if they know you're infected, they're gonna put a mobile fence around you, and if you leave, you're gonna get in trouble if you leave your, it's basically the, the, your mobile phone is your new ankle bracelet. You know, we look at what China did, including welding uh, certain doors uh, shut, and we seem to be sort of knee-jerk ad hoc, and we're, you know, culturally we can't do this, yet our, our numbers are, are through the roof. So our autocratic regimes better at dealing with things like this than democratic ones? I don't think so. I mean, there are arguments being made that China can do things uh, that the United States can't. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that what these autocratic countries are doing is 
actually more effective. Um, there are really only two things that we know to be true. One is that no one knows uh, the true number of infected because we can only, in the absolute best case, uh, know the confirmed cases of people that we've actually tested. Uh, and once you start to layer in this uh, autocratic, or I would argue more authoritarian, uh, type of policy structure, um, what you end up seeing is that instead of policy being guided by science and facts, uh, you begin to see things like information releases uh, becoming political decisions. Um, now, this is not new. Uh, in fact, the, the Spanish flu around 1918 um, <laughs> did not actually originate in Spain. Uh, it was actually spreading uh, in World War I through the trenches uh, where everybody was in terrible conditions, but the militaries of the day had imposed restrictions on what the press could report uh, that could impact the war effort. And so Spain, being a neutral country, uh, was publishing uh, what, what they were actually seeing in their country. And so we just presumed, uh, because they were the only ones that were telling the truth, uh, that it came from them. Now, we're a little further ahead than that today, um, but that doesn't uh, erase the fact that people in power who see that there is a political advantage to disguising or concealing or massaging or denying uh, numbers may choose uh, to lie about it. It's happened before and it's almost certainly happening now. If you're looking at countries like China, which seems to have flattened, how much can we trust that those numbers are actually true? Uh, I don't think we can. Particularly, we see the Chinese government recently uh, working to expel Western journalists uh, at precisely uh, this moment where we need credible independent reporting from this kind of region. Uh, and then there's all of these rumors and initial reports that say things like, you know, the number of urn shipments for burials uh, have gone way up, way beyond what you would expect from the official numbers. And the fact that we cannot get independent verification of the facts gives us reason to doubt the official story. And the reality that we need to accept, um, which is an uncomfortable reality, uh, is that even in places uh, that are not autocratic regimes, they're going to have a second wave, they're going to have a third wave, they're going to have a fourth wave based on all of the uh, best medical analysis that we have available today. I think uh, I was reading um, a paper this morning uh, that was from, I think, the, the Chan School of Public Health uh, at, I think it was Harvard University, that said uh, pumping the brakes is going to have to be the new strategy. Which means we're at the beginning of, as you say, you know, second, third, fourth waves of this coming. And so all of these measures are going to get more severe. And what then happens to civil liberties, to privacy rights, to democracy? I mean, what are the knock-on effects that you can see? The, I mean, this is really the, the, the central question of this moment in history. Um, what we see is everyone is fearful um, and hopeless and so worried about today um, that we have really stopped thinking about what tomorrow will look like uh, as a result of the decisions that we take today. Uh, we've seen in countries like Taiwan and South Korea, uh, and spreading also into more Western countries, um, and of course in the United States where it has begun as well, the tracking and monitoring of the movements of the whole of the human population through the movements of our phones. And it is, I think, uh, something that should raise cause for concern because when we talk about the applications, and I'm, I'm sure we will, they're, they're saying they're using it for contact tracing. This person gets sick, uh, where did they go? Who may they have come in contact with precisely so they can produce these kind of text messages that you describe? On its face, it seems like it might be a good idea. Uh, there is, of course, a, a natural presumed benefit here. And yet, uh, this level of contact tracing, this, this method of contact tracing, uh, does not really work on a pandemic scale. You know, we're declaring, you know, various states of emergencies here and there, but these have sweeping powers. What is being built is the architecture of oppression. So when we look at South Korea, when we look at China, when we look at, you know, Taiwan, Singapore, countries like this, 
now America, there's all of this data being collected. How are the governments, so when in, 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 in South Korea, I get a text saying, oh, you met Joe Blow, he might be infected, you should you know, sequester yourself for 14 days. How are they getting that data? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, that's really the one that should make everyone uh, just look at their phone and, you know, sort of raise an eyebrow. Um, there are a number of ways that you can track the location of someone through their phone. Uh, there are the cell phone towers themselves, but there's also uh, the wireless network that you're connected to. And then what other wireless networks are around you that you're not connected to? This you can think of as what wireless networks your phone can hear. And so these wireless network identifiers are then collected and they're mapped out against GPS. And then they know if you can see mom's Wi-Fi and neighbor Ted's Wi-Fi and the library Wi-Fi all at the same time, you have to be within range of these things. It becomes a proxy for location. Now that we know uh, all of our phones can and are being tracked at all times just by being turned on, um, the phone companies have it at a bare minimum. Facebook probably has it, Google probably has it, Apple probably has it, uh, and many, many other companies you've never even heard of that run ad networks. What this really means in uh, a France or a, a United States is they go, well, look, we're aware of privacy concerns, so what we're gonna do is we're going to um, depersonalize this information. We're going to anonymize it, and we're not gonna look at individuals. We're gonna look at the flows of uh, movement of these phones, right? We're not looking at one phone, we're looking at the aggregate movements of phones. The problem is, if you're not tracking one infection or a hundred infections, but you're tracking a hundred thousand infections, contact tracing quickly becomes useless and more uh, the precision of location information is either so rough that it is largely useless, which is the case if we're talking about the cell phone networks, the cell phone towers from near, to very, very precise location information, in which case this information, when you're applying it at scale, uh, cannot be anonymized in a meaningful way. And then there's this big question of, well, where does all that information go? Uh, how is it controlled? Who is it being used? It's information about me. Uh, I should have some influence over it. I should have control over it. Um, but unfortunately, in the United States, to a large degree, uh, you don't. There is no basic privacy law uh, in the United States. We need to be able to make sure that the brakes that are being pumped are on the pandemic rather than our society. You know, it seems that this is maybe the greatest question of the modern era around civil liberties, um, around the right to privacy. Um, yet, no one's asking this question. We, we really don't hear a lot about it. Um, and so now, this is pro probably the largest societal zeitgeist change to, yes, have the information because we have to stop this thing. You know, we're declaring, you know, various states of emergencies here and there, but these have sweeping powers. So we're sitting here in America, quarantined and saying, okay, what does this mean going forward? When I think about the future, when any of us look at where this is heading, we need to think about where we've been. And sadly, these kind of emergency powers that are born out of crises have a perfect history of abuse. I mean, down the board, whenever you look at these things, uh, the funniest part about it, uh, in a dark way, is that the emergency never ends. It becomes normalized when you talk about mass surveillance. The Bush-era warrantless wiretapping program, um, only part of it was shut down. I um, mean, it's rolled over and it's rolled over and it's rolled over. And we've reformed things at the edges, but the basic practices of what was supposed to be a stopgap emergency, which was in response to another stopgap emergency, was, which was, of course, the legacy of 9-11 and the Patriot Act. And we are still today engaged in the same wars uh, that we declared nearly 20 years ago that we have not managed to escape. 
uh, you know, we had, uh, as a result of 9-11, the, the rise of a nuclear Iran, uh, because their, their counterbalance in Iraq was removed. Uh, we saw authoritarianism uh, begin to creep across Western societies, places we wouldn't expect, uh, like Hungary and Poland. As authoritarianism spreads, as emergency laws proliferate, as we sacrifice our rights, uh, we also sacrifice our capability to arrest this slide into a less liberal and less free world. Uh, do you truly believe uh, that when the first wave, the second wave, the 16th wave of the coronavirus is a long forgotten memory, uh, that these capabilities will not be kept, that these data sets will not be kept? Will those capabilities begin to be applied to small-time criminality? Will they begin to be applied to political analysis? Will they begin to be applied for doing things like uh, performing a census? Will they be used for political polling? No matter how it is being used, what is being built is the architecture of oppression. And you might trust who is dealing with it today. You might trust who runs it. You might go, you know, I don't care about Mark Zuckerberg, but someone else will have this data eventually. Some other country will have this data eventually. In your country, a different president will have control of this data eventually, and someone will abuse it. Now, could China use it for something interesting to them? Yes. And what happens when they abuse it? And I believe they already have. You know, they're, they're running internment camps in China. And these practices, when they don't get pushback, when they don't get condemnation, when they don't face sanction for this, will become normalized and it will spread. And we'll face them in Russia. We'll face them in Iran. And then we'll face them in Poland. We'll face them in Hungary. We'll face them throughout Europe. We will face them in the United States because we will face them everywhere. This is a pivotal moment. And why is. is nobody talking about this? Because we're scared. We've talked about, this is, let's say, the first wave. And until there's a, a functioning uh, a vaccine, there's going to be more waves. There's going to be more pandemics. I mean, this is just the way it's going to go. So if there's going to be more waves of COVID-19, and in fact, more waves of other pandemics going forward, then theoretically, there will be more information, more information collected, more information shared. This is the quote unquote new normal. This is just, it's not going to get better. This is just it. This is a pivotal moment. And why is. is nobody talking about this? Because we're scared. If we work together, if we think about how we can protect ourselves, our families, our communities, our hospitals, uh, if we think about how we can work together internationally to overcome this as our waves peak in different places at different times, we cooperate, um, we can start to get this space to think not about addressing the symptom of our overcrowded and unequal world, which is this virus that has spread across borders instantly. When you look at what's happened, when we had this health crisis and it very quickly morphed into an economic crisis and then very quickly became a financial crisis. Um, you see all the governments of the world leap into action. And it's interesting that you see the majority of this money go not to the public, uh, not to hospitals, but to businesses, loans, to the groups uh, and corporations uh, that actually created the systemic problems that were exacerbated by this sudden sharp decline. But we need to remember uh, that this virus will pass, but the decisions that we make today uh, in this atmosphere will last. Um, we will have to live with them, our children will have to live with them, all of our posterity will. Uh, it's not just about America, it's not just about your city, um, it's about everywhere. Because these systems, if we do not change them, they're going to make decisions for us on an automated basis to determine who gets a job, who gets a home, and who does not.
So we seem to be heading into this uncharted territory. And I wanted to ask you, you know, step back, take some time. What should we be thinking about? What should we be concentrating on? One of the things that strikes me is uh, the sensation that this is, you know, bolt out of the blue. It couldn't have been prevented. It couldn't have been resisted. It couldn't have been imagined um, that this would come to pass, this, this global pandemic. Uh, when you think about the average American, uh, you know, they go to work every day. They spend 10 hours uh, at the office, in the car, away from their family, away from their home. And by the end of the day, they've got no space to think. And now all of us collectively at the same time has been forced into a global sabbatical uh, all around the world, which is an extraordinarily rare event in history. We are at one of the only moments that will be in our lifetimes where the system is so stressed and so overextended and the leadership so clearly out of its league that we have the ability to make not reformative changes, but revolutionary changes, that we can actually change the functioning of society, that we can actually change the structure of the system that controls and influences our lives, the way that we are being monitored, the way that we're being tracked. Because these systems, if we do not change them, will not simply be used to monitor our health. They're going to make decisions for us on an automated basis to determine who gets a job, who goes to school, who gets a loan, who gets a home, and who does not? And we today are being asked in a moment of extraordinary fear, what do we want these systems to look like? And if we don't make that decision ourselves, it will be made for us. Edward Snowden, thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Shane.